Hello, I'm Chris Sarley, Investment Research Analyst at Chelsea Financial Services, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Simon Brazier, Manager of the Elite Rated 91 UK Alpha Fund. Thank you for joining us today, Simon. Morning, Chris. Um, just wanted to start with a bit of a snapshot of the fund. You, you've got sort of four different buckets of stocks that you've been looking at. Could you maybe sort of talk us through all four sort of in sort of order, please? Yeah, so normally my turnover in the fund is pretty low, but this year with the market volatility, we've seen some real opportunities. So we were able to sell a lot of the, well, reduce a lot of the positions that perform very well, some of the more defensive positions. And as you said, there were four areas that we recycled that capital into. And the first was just existing stocks that we owned that had fallen. So the likes of Fever Tree that you know, had halved um, you know, during the pandemic and have actually bounced back and doubled almost since then. Um, there were good quality companies that we knew well, you know, like Fever Tree, um, like Smith & Nephew, that we were able to add to, uh, we thought, very attractive valuations. And um, the second set was the stocks which I call I have on my bench. These were many names that... I would have wanted to have owned prior to the pandemic, but actually, due to valuation, we felt that they were too expensive. And again, we got an opportunity in the likes of Hargreaves, Lansdowne, Essential, um, Burberry, to buy companies that we like for the long term, but buy them on much more attractive valuations. The third bucket um, was the stocks I call the directly impacted by COVID stocks. So these are like the leisure stocks and the airlines, for example. Now, we haven't gone mad here, but we just added to to a few names where we felt that the valuation was pricing in a severe recession and actually where their balance sheets were strong. So a classic example of that would be Ryanair, actually, where we've you know, added to that position. It's got a very strong balance sheet. It can survive for another six, 12 months with no flights whatsoever. And we do think that once we have a vaccine, this company's valuation, therefore, would look quite attractive from this point in time. And finally, the interesting one for me is the oil and gas sector. It's, a, it's an area I've been underweight probably throughout my whole career, actually, of 20 years. Um, but actually, during the pandemic, there was a, there was dislocation. We were able to buy buy into those, we, and we went um, neutral the sector. Actually, more recently, we really found a position where they looked far too cheap. And actually, for the first time in my career, we've gone overweight oil and gas sort of at the beginning of November, which has certainly helped us in the short to medium term, um, as you've seen that value rotation in the market. But also, actually, I think that if you were to see any recovery in oil prices from here, as, as the economies improve, then they, they look quite attractive. Uh, you mentioned the, the third bucket there and that some of them have been impacted by the pandemic. And you, you talked about Ryanair specifically. Um, you've also decided to keep EasyJet. Could you maybe explain why? And, and also, by contrast, you, you sold National Express. Explain why in that case as well. Yeah, I mean, what I did was I, I, I did feel that um, as we go into the end of this year and the beginning of next using a football analogy, I wanted my best team on the pitch. Mm -hmm. And that for me means the companies with the best balance sheets in their sectors and with the best opportunity set. So while I think National Express in itself is probably a very good investment from here, I'm actually, you know, they lost their chief exec during, you know, post the pandemic, he moved to another company. And so actually I, I sold that because I really feel Ryanair and EasyJet have better balance sheets. And actually they will come out of this pandemic in a stronger position in point-to-point -point airlines in Europe. Um, many of their competitors will either have gone to the wall or will be struggling under state aid rules in Europe and in, in terms of unable to get funding. So the reality is for me, I, I wanted the best names on the pitch and and therefore you know, National Express didn't quite make the mark. You, you spoke about the best names on the pitch. Um, you recently uh, bought Burberry. Could, what do you like specifically about that company? You know, Burberry has such strong, um, such a strong brand, particularly in Asia, and it was one that was certainly hit due to the lack of travel in Asia. But for us, it's a company that has very strong cash generation, as I said, a very strong brand, and I think we've been able to buy it at a valuation that more than um, compensates for any sort of medium-term risk around sort of further Asian travel issues. So again, a good quality company that we can buy at a good price. And your largest holding is the London Stock Exchange at the moment. Yeah. Do you think a, a sort of no-deal Brexit is a threat to this business? And what are your thoughts on Brexit generally? So on London Stock Exchange specifically, um, their main driver of their business is their clearing business. And actually, they have an exemption, at least till 2022, from the European Union, whereby EU banks can still use London Stock Exchange platforms in order to match their trades. Um, the reality actually is, is that it is by far the largest pool of capital. And so we feel that 
even after 2022, LSE is such an integral part of the, the financial system, so, so systemic in some respects, that it will still continue to do well. Um, there is a risk, I suppose, around there buying a, a business in the US called Refinitiv. So if the EU Commission wanted to play politics, they could try and block that deal. But I have to be honest, I think that would be, they would be cutting their nose off to spite their face based on the importance for LSC with their own banking system. Um, so the wider point on Brexit, just very quickly, um, I think we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. The, the deal the EU are offering is a very, very thin trade deal. And it's not much better than no deal, to be honest. And I think what we're going to see is politics driving that from now. And what Boris Johnson, is, I think, is literally weighing up. Do I go with no deal and I keep my party together? Or do I go with a very poor trade deal and risk having to get that through Parliament with the backing of Labour and all the politics that means? So the long and short of it is you know, the recent OBR and Bank of England analysis is that either outcome is, is pretty poor for the UK economy. And one of your other top 10 holdings is GB Group, which is operating in the fraud prevention space. Obviously, online fraud in particular has picked up during the pandemic. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about this stock and, and how it operates? You've picked one of my favourite stocks. I mean, GB Group is a great UK technology business, actually, that, as you say, is in fraud and identity ver verification. So they, they actually can pinpoint over half of the world's population as to where they live, which enables retailers and others who need data to verify people with, you know, with that information. So it's growing very quickly. And of course, with the pandemic, we've seen an acceleration of online um, shopping and also the, you know, the, the fact that people are not entering their banks anymore. The, they, the ability to verify people online is incredibly important. So it's a great growth business that has wonderful data, wonderful technology, and is actually a world leader in what it does. And just lastly, could you maybe give us a brief outlook on how you see the UK economy performing in 2021? Well, from the economic perspective, I'm really sorry to say that it, it looks pretty dire. I mean, we've, we're seeing the OBR is saying 11% fall in GDP for this year. That is the biggest since the 1700s and the Great Frost, which was the last time we saw a single year impact like that. I don't believe in the bounce back very quickly. And the simple reason of that is all the forecasts assume that consumers go back to their original spending patterns. And for me, with the uncertainty around Brexit, the uncertainty around unemployment, people's uncertainty about their jobs means I think people will continue to save more than they spend, like we've seen in the last six or nine months. And the UK economy is very reliant on consumer spending, need two thirds of GDP is domestic consumption. So I'm not hanging my hat on a fast recovery for the UK economy. Having said that, as everyone always says, less than a third of UK revenues of companies come from the UK. So we are able to find a GB group, a classic example, where a significant chunk of their revenues come from overseas. And you know, the GDP outlook globally looks better than the UK. So I'm still able to find plenty of opportunities in the UK fund. Simon, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Cheers, Chris. And for more information on the 91 UKL Alpha Fund, please visit chelseafs.co.uk.